Japan has uh, order. The honourable member's time has expired. The clerk. The clerk. The, I've called the clerk, and, and perhaps you have the courtesy to tell me what it is you want to raise. But uh, the next item for business on the blue is is the clerk. No. The, the Leader of Opposition Business well knows that I always extend courtesy to the Opposition, but I need to know beforehand. I've called the clerk. Mr. 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 Deputy Speaker, I exercised the courtesy by going to you and saying that, 30 the, seconds lead, ago. that the Leader of yes, but before mm. the clerk was no. called, and I no. said the leader, of the, opposition, the leader of the Opposition was seeking the call. Yes, and I said and I would— you said you would call the clerk, yes. and I said, well, that will bring on new business. Yes, and it will and bring I on new business, the, the, according the to the The Leader of the, the Opposition blue. needs the call before new business is brought on. No, well, the, the chair has determined this, the clerk is being called. The clerk. This, Mr Deputy now, Speaker, I do not know how— This is getting out of hand. I do not this know how— Resume your seat. The member for opposition, the Leader of Opposition has the call, yes. Well, I just say to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, you are unfair and you are not treating the parliament no. with respect. Point no. Of order, Mr. Speaker. no. I'll hear the Leader of the uh, National Party. Mr Speaker, in support of the member for Hume, he has now signified to the House that he in fact did alert you before you called the clerk. That makes it a double crime no. in passing oh, the, over uh, the Leader of the order, Opposition. The, uh, the, the Leader of the National Party will withdraw, withdraw that. I withdraw the word crime. It makes it I'm a relaxed. double breach of convention in jumping over the Leader of the Opposition who has a perfect right to seek the call with or without notice to the Speaker, but you were given notice. You've admitted to the House you were given notice, and you have still gone the wrong way. I submit, in the fairness and in and appealing to your no. fair side as a Deputy Speaker and Chairman of Committees, that uh, in all the circumstances arising, and given the fact the Member for Hume did give you notice and you indicated that to the House, that uh, you review that decision and give a call to the Leader of the Opposition in accordance with correct balance and operation. I heard the Leader of the National Party. The Le Leader of Opposition Business approached me momentarily before I was about to call the clerk and said, would I give the Leader of the Opposition the call? I said, no, I will call the clerk as according to the business paper. I will call the clerk. I have called the clerk. We will proceed. Government Business, Notice number 2, CSIRO Redevelopment, North Ryde, New South Wales. Uh, the before I call the parliamentary secretary, I'll hear a point of order from the oh, thank right on member for New England. Mr. Speaker, I point out to you that as far as our proceedings are concerned, there is no precedent given them if a member is on his feet. If you have noticed, or if you've been given notice that a member is on his feet, then mm. that takes precedence over anything that's on the standing orders, the, the, that's uh, on the notice paper. Mr. Speaker, there is absolutely mm. no priority given by the notice paper, they are there for the indication, the blue in particular, the indication to members only. And I would put to you that you are quite outside the powers exercisable by you in denying to a member on his feet, of whose rising you had notice, you are quite outside your powers in denying him the call. And I'd suggest to you that in normal circumstances it would be a matter that could lead to a dissent from your ruling. And I don't well, think that the, the, the right that you member, would seek. I thank the right member for New England. The right, the right honourable member for New England should know that the chair had not recognised the leader of the opposition. The chair had not recognised the leader of the opposition. The chair had not, and the chair had called the clerk. And we will proceed. And the parliamentary secretary, honourable parliamentary Speaker, secretary, Mr. Speaker, I move that the speaker's ruling be descended from. The question is the motion to be agreed to. Those of that opinion, please. Right. You may proceed. Mr. Speaker, you, you and the Mr. Deputy Speaker, I should say, and, and the Speaker have made a total mockery of fair practice in this Parliament. Um, I will, the chair will require you submit the uh, motion in writing. The motion to in writing. Sign it. have been fixed easily. I second the motion. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I was saying, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Speaker and yourself are reducing this Parliament to a mockery. To a total mockery. It is blatantly unfair that the, the uh, procedures of the House are uh, generally disregarded to our disadvantage in the, in the uh, rulings that you and the Speaker bring from time to time in, in debate in this House. This is a classic case which has obviously been prompted by the fact that the Prime Minister today scurried out of this parliament, scurried out, scurried out of this parliament completely flummoxed by the fact that he couldn't answer the question. Uh, point of order, the Leader of the, uh, leader of the House. This is, this, is now, this is not a motion of censure on you. It's a, it's a technical...
discussion of whether or not your ruling is correct. And this is a, this is a, he, the Leader of the Opposition is broadening it outside that technical discussion as to whether or not you are within standing orders, and he is not entitled to do it. I, um, I will hear the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I'm sure he's aware that uh, the debate is to be confined to the question of the decision that the Chair has made and not other matters before the House. I'm sure he's aware of that. Well, the the of the Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact is a very simple one. The fact is that the Leader of Opposition Business had informed you that I would be seeking a call. He'd done what you asked and what you've subsequently said he should have done. He simply came to you and said that I would be seeking the call. And you well, it, has, it, has, it, uh, it certainly has the standing when, when the speaker, it certainly has standing when the, speaker himself, the deputy speaker himself said that if that had been pursued, he would have uh, adhered to that ruling. This, this paper has no standing. There's no, no priority here in the calling of the clerk particularly when we've got uh, what was obviously going to be a major motion that we wanted to move before this parliament at this time about the behaviour of the Prime Minister and one of his ministers, a very important motion that was to be put before this, this, uh, this parliament concerning the, the fact that the Prime Minister was unable to answer a question in parliament today, he got completely flummoxed, panicked and ran out of here like Groucho Marx instead of, uh, instead of uh, staying in here and, and completing the processes of question time. Now, you're obviously aware that, this, that, that we were going to come back into the parliament and demand that the Prime Minister uh, uh, return to this place and give a full account of, uh, of the circumstances of that question and the issue at hand, the behaviour of one of his senior cabinet ministers, and a matter of great impropriety. And uh, the procedures now of the House are just being abused by your ruling so as to, uh, to prevent that debate, trying to call on the business of the parliament so that we can't proceed with the debate. And it is for that reason that I'm, that I'm moving dissent. But it is indicative of what has become a trend in this place to the, uh, the total destruction, virtually, of the significance of this institution in the eyes of the Australian people. And, and that is a very serious event. And, uh, uh, we've used uh, in many, in many uh, arguments in the past. I've documented, and recently, as the occasion that I, uh, uh, that I censured the speaker, the speaker uh, at the end of the last uh, days of sitting of this parliament, I drew attention to the fact that question time, in particular, had become a mockery, and the number of questions have been dramatically the reduced the relative to historical standards. Beyond, the, beyond the, the specific matter, uh, before well, the specific the matter is absolutely clear cut. No, the, the specific matter is, is clear cut. That you, you sought a, a notice from us. You sought notice from us as to you, you asked required, that, which is not required, but you were given, in fact, notice from us uh, by the leader of opposition business that I intended to move a motion. You disregarded that and went ahead and proceeded to call the clerk. And it is for that reason that I'm moving to Senate. Is the motion seconded? Yes. Mr. Speaker. The uh, Leader of the National Party. I second the motion. And, Mr. Speaker, I second the motion, and in so doing, uh, I want to point out the uh, chronological sequence of the events which occurred here this afternoon because they go to the core of parliamentary democracy, the, uh, not, not only the formal requirements of the House, it's expressed in the standing orders, but the many conventions and courtesies which exist in real terms and which are all about giving people a fair go on both sides of the House and relate specifically to your ruling this afternoon in calling on the clerk at an inappropriate time, given all the circumstances. And that's why I did take my point of order in support of the member for Hume and the Leader of the Opposition that uh, perhaps on reflection that you could have avoided this dissent motion by simply giving the call uh, because uh, you deliberately looked down at the time, which made it even worse, uh, looked down, called the clerk in the knowledge clearly that you knew the Leader of the Opposition was jumping at that time, because that's the order of batting. Members need to understand exactly what happened. Members of the public need to understand exactly what happened. The Leader of Opposition the Business in the House came in, came in and approached your chair in the time available and it was a short time. He did not have to do that, but he did approach the chair and said to you the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking a call and uh, you need not have said any more than that, but the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking a call for you uh, and to advise you, as a matter of absolute courtesy only, that the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking a call. And I understand, I think, from the, the, uh, the member for Hume that he went on to further to say and would be seeking to move a motion. 
seeking the call, and uh, let's keep it at that, and that's exactly uh, an extra courtesy which was being afforded by simply even signifying that uh, before the House. So you, Mr Deputy Speaker, were informed by the person you have every reason to uh, respect the advice of and has a particular function on the floor of the House, denoted as Leader of the Opposition Business, and you received that information. At that time, or shortly thereafter, uh, the uh, MPI speaker came to conclusion as the fourth speaker on a very important matter of public importance, moved by the member for Benelong and seconded by the member for Guida, which uh, in fact said, and, I, uh, and, and which at that stage you then, as I said, looked down and, and called the clerk in the knowledge that the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking the call. So what we have is a double breach of convention, a double breach of procedure, and one which I find personally very upsetting because the opposition was of the view, Mr Deputy Speaker, that you would might, might make a whole lot better speaker than the current speaker, but I know I'm not allowed to dwell on that path other than to say that uh, this matter was put uh, to you in a very fair way. Worse still, you then affirmed that chronology of events. After I took the point of order and the member for Hume took the point of order, you in fact said and advised the House formally that you had been given notice prior to you calling the clerk that the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking the call. I repeat that. You affirmed to the House as Deputy Speaker of the House, in charge of business at this time in the House, that the uh, Leader of the Opposition would be seeking the call. And there was then an elapse of a further, albeit short period of time, before then, in fact, you called the clerk, but it exactly, and in the head of doing that, the Leader of the Opposition was on his feet. And there are other members present who will verify my own eyesight from a couple of metres. It may not be the best eyesight, but will verify that the Leader of the Opposition was on his feet, he'd given notice, and he was properly, legitimately seeking to call to raise an important matter. So I say to you, Mr Deputy Speaker, you have failed in terms of this specific matter, the subject of this specific, very serious dissent motion. I think it's a good period of time since we've had a dissent motion uh, in the House to a specific ruling. It's one not moved lightly, but you have gone too far. We gave you the chance to come back in the interests of the uh, proceedings of this parliament being kept on an even keel, in the interests of a fair go, in the interests of merely uh, some 45 minutes or whatever the other item on the blue might have taken, uh, the item of the blue, of course, the notice paper having a limited status before the House. But I have to put in a second point, which I think is even more serious. We are talking about the Leader of the Opposition seeking the call, not a member of the House. And whilst all 148 of us would like to think, in a sense, that we are equals. We are certainly all members of this House of Representatives. There are procedures, there are conventions, and there are long-standing conventions which say that when the Leader of the Opposition seeks for a call, he is given a measure of priority, he is given a measure of courtesy, and that is laid down in various uh, practices of the parliament and, uh, to a lesser extent, admittedly, in the standing orders. So on two counts, Mr Speaker, we find that you have failed in the order and the correct uh, order that you gave and the correct ruling that you gave was incorrect and is deserving of the dissent of the House. And I appeal to the two independents who are not in the chamber at this time. This goes to the core of all that they would have us want to believe about their service in this House, championing the rights of parliamentary democracy, the rights of people to get a fair hearing, that they come down into the House, listen to this debate and vote accordingly when we get to that stage. Because, sir, you have breached the courtesy extended to you. You really have. You have breached the courtesy extended to you, which you have confirmed to the House, but the member for Hume gave you notice with regard to the Leader of the Opposition jumping. And secondly, you have breached the convention associated with the proceedings of the parliament in failing to give the call of the leader of the, uh, to the Leader of the Opposition. The third point I would make, which I think uh, 
is a, is a critical one, and I have great respect for the clerks at the table. And I do not involve them in debate because that would be totally out of order. But I do point out that the clerks of the House are just that. They are the clerks of the House. They do an enormous amount of work behind the scenes. They give good advice to both sides of the House. They have a proper and functioning role to uh, continue in their work, but they do not take precedence over the Leader of the Opposition. They do not take precedence, for that matter, over the, uh, member for, uh, the retiring member for Hindmarsh. They do not even take precedence over the member for Gray. And well might I choose those two members because they've both had enough. They're jumping ship. They've announced they're quitting Parliament. They're retiring from the Parliament along with the Minister of Immigration. But I come back to the point, Mr. Speaker. I come back to the point, Mr. Deputy Speaker. That order, the, that order, the honourable the minister. The honourable minister should re resume his seat. I come back to the specific point that the clerks have their ordained role. There is one fragile moment in the proceedings of the parliament when, in fact, the clerk has an even more elevated role, and that is during the period of the election of the Speaker of the House at the start of the proceedings after each parliamentary term. But equally, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say to members of the House, members of the gallery who witnessed this chronology of events, that the clerks are just that, the clerks of the House, and they do not take precedence over the Leader of the Opposition. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I put it to the House. I appeal to the sense of fair play of yourself. I appeal to the sense of fair play of members on both sides of the House and the independents that, in fact, on this occasion there is cause for us to uh, uh, give the Deputy Speaker the chance of the time that has elapsed since he made this ruling, if he'd like to signify that he's prepared to reverse that ruling in the, in the light of the information which has been presented, we equally would be prepared to uh, withdraw the uh, motion that's before the chair, because events do happen quite quickly. They, uh, uh, matters of human error can occur as well, but in the absence of that, I am an optimist, but in the absence of that, uh, and, in a, and in a genuine appeal that the whole proceedings of the parliament would be greatly helped if indeed the deputy speaker took that course of action here today. But in the absence of that, let me say in very black and white terms why everyone in this House should on this occasion vote for this motion. Firstly, because the courtesies were observed. The Deputy Speaker was advised the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking the call, and the Deputy Speaker has confirmed that on the floor of the House. It's been exposed, it's been caught red-handed. So on the first count, all courtesies have been observed. Secondly, the absolute convention has been observed in as much as the Leader of the Opposition jump and jump ahead of the Deputy Speaker calling on the clerk, and that was clear cut and it was observed by a number of people in this House. And he said, Mr Deputy Speaker, and indeed there was even a further very short period of time, I, I concede, before uh, that then went on. Uh, to the third point I make, and that is that no clerk has precedence over any member of the House or any uh, uh, leader of the opposition above all else, uh, and that you recognise the particular priority of the leader of the opposition who sought to move that the Prime Minister provide a full explanation to the House as to why he has failed to discipline the Minister for Transport and Communications for a clear breach of his responsibilities to disclose his interests and to declare a relevant interest in matters decided by Cabinet a truly relevant matter, given all the proceedings on the floor of the House this day. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I once again appeal to your good nature, to your track record past—not always, I guess, perfect, but nevertheless a track record in which we were prepared to give you the benefit of the doubt—to recommit this matter, as is your jurisdiction, as is your capability in seeking the indulgence of the House to recommit this matter in a way which would allow the Leader of the Opposition to proceed with his quite proper motion in all the circumstances. But in the absence of that, Mr Speaker, I commend to all members of the House the motion constructively, carefully moved that you, this uh, ruling be dissented upon 
for all the reasons I've advanced, because uh, you have made a monumental error. You have confessed that error in as many words. You have much to answer for, and this ruling should be reversed. Before, before I call the Leader of the, uh, uh, the House, um, the Leader of the National Party did uh, invite the Chair to clarify a matter or actually to respond to a matter. It, um, it was the Chair's intention to call the clerk and proceed with the first item, business notice number two, after which the Chair, having ascertained from the Leader of Opposition Business what was intended, we could have easily well called the Leader of the Opposition the, and saved us all this difficulty. No, no. Look, look. Resume your seat. Just, just resume your seat for a minute. Resume your seat. The leader of the National Party has asked me to clarify a matter. I'm clarifying it, and that was the intention of the chair. However, however, and I'll say this to the leader of opposition business: you are so determined to have your way that you wouldn't let the chair clarify the matter beforehand. Um, now, you, you have a point of order. You may proceed. On a point of order, I submit to you that there is no obligation on the part of any member to advise you as to what is going to be said when a member is called. Yep. But as a matter of courtesy, I indicated to you that the Leader of the Opposition would be seeking a call. Mm. The uh, Leader of the uh, Point of Order, the Member for O'Connor. I draw your attention to the standing orders in this manner, and uh, I draw your attention firstly to section 59. And of, on page 21, and of course the heading that precedes that, which says manner and right of speech, and there's a series of, of, of sections going down from 59, which is every member desiring to speak shall rise and address himself to the speaker. Now I put it to you as a point of order that that in itself does not say any member or any clerk. It says any member, and it clearly designates both the the, the right of a member to attract your attention and consequently be called upon to speak. I put it to you further that uh, because this section makes no provision, the process of calling the clerk is to call on government business, and that can only be done if a member does not desire the right to speak. And the only way the government can prevent that member from speaking is to move that government business be called on. That process was not followed, and consequently, in no. the order of the only person you, attempting to stand, my point of order has got to be heard out. Yeah, the only re person who stood at that order, point in Northern time Church. as a member of this House was the Leader of the Opposition and was therefore entitled no. to the call. Uh, and okay. that is the end of the subject. Point, point of order, the Leader of the House. Point of order is the, yes, you can. Of course, you, you can. can. The point, of order, uh, the point of order is this. The point of order, is, Mr. Speaker, is that he is debating an issue on the point of order. No. The point of order is he is. He is, he is member for Pearce will resume his seat. He is. Uh, the, the, the member for Pearce will resume his seat. Why should I? Why is that rule? He's not recording. He's not observing you. Because there is no point of order yet been made by the Leader of the House, so we don't know what it is you're taking a point of order on. Just resume your seat and we'll hear this point of order. The, uh, the, point of order, the point of order is that he's debating the issue. He's not, in fact, uh, raising a point of order. That is I, the issue before the chair. I, I, order. I, can, I, considered, I consider the member for O'Connor had still some point to make, so I'll call the member for O'Connor. I can conclude on the point of my point of order that, as there was only one member standing, it was your obligation to call that member, irrespective of the government's desire to carry on with its business. Whilst a member was on his feet, considering the, those particular standing orders, he had to be called, and in fact, mm. the only way the government could prevent it was not by you doing something, but by them taking a specific action of moving government business was called on. They did not do that, so it was your obligation to call the only member standing, which was the Leader the chair, of the Opposition. The Chair has heard the point of order of the uh, member for O'Connor. The, the point, very simply, is the Chair has the discretion to call business as the chair chooses. The chair had called business on it. From there, it's a question of who rises. But the chair had called a matter of business. However, I have to be careful not to enter the debate, um, and, and I'm, I'm conscious of that. I'm conscious of that. So the, the, leader, uh, the question is the motion to be agreed to the Leader of the House. I oppose the motion, uh, Mr Speaker, and uh, I don't particularly consider the last speaker of the, uh, uh, to this motion as, uh, as necessarily a reliable witness. He got up here in this. Uh, he was up here in. The, he was up here in this place. He was up um, here. I'm not talking. Uh, no, um, order, I'm not talking order, about order, you, order, Goose. Order. order. The, um, 
Order. Order. The Leader, the leader of the House should resume his seat. The member for O'Connor. Well, Mr Speaker, if I wasn't the last speaker, you were, and in that point he has called someone a non-reliable witness, and unless he's not referring to me, he should re is, is referring to me, he should withdraw no. that. It's an the, outrageous the, statement, and you can sit down while I'm um, talking. The um, order. Well, would the, you ask the uh, order, minister the member for O'Connor will resume his seat. The Leader of the House has withdrawn. The Leader of the House. The Honourable Member, who is the last speaker, asked for a withdrawal of the statement that he was an unreliable witness, and, and I'm happy to withdraw it, but that must be just about the most sensitive performance of anybody in the debate in this place who, rather con who considers himself a robust performer. So I, cheer I cheerfully withdraw to the shrinking violence. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that he came into this place and he spent a considerable amount of time disrupting the end of question time, which he referred to in terms of the chronology of his presentation and his argument, on the grounds that the Prime Minister had not asked further questions be placed on notice. A review of the tapes reveals quite clearly that the Prime Minister had, uh, some ten minutes after question time would normally conclude, had, uh, had uh, in fact asked that, uh, that further questions be placed on the notice paper. So uh, he, uh, in, in questions where he asked us to pass, as he asked us to pass some judgment on his, his sight and hearing during the course of, uh, of his uh, presentation here, we can pass judgment on his sight and hearing on the basis of that evidence. Um, order the uh, member for O'Connor has a point of order. Uh, member for, I'm sorry, member for Kurt. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, you were pretty uh, severe on the leader of the opposition when he's speaking to this motion, and you drew him back to uh, the point of the question before the House, uh, before he got anywhere near a far, as far away from the question as the leader of the House has. So why don't you do the same thing for him? The, uh, the honour of the leader of the House. I'm sure he's aware of the constraints of the matter before the I, House. I, I am. I am responding specifically to a point raised in debate, as you well know. And uh, once you place something on the table in debate, which is not in fact called attention to on those grounds by the Speaker, then you may uh, obviously respond to it in the course of uh, your own reply. And I'm glad to see you're cackling away to uh, acknowledge yourself the ridiculousness of the point that you made. But the point that is, is at debate here is, is, is what is an appropriate order as far as the Speaker is concerned. And the fact of the matter is that the House is totally within the control of the Speaker. The Speaker can choose to recognise whom he cares. And speakers have had that right for hundreds of years and, in the case of this parliament, for about 90 of them. And if he chooses not to recognise somebody on his feet but calls the clerk to bring on business, then that's too bad for the person concerned. That's all there is to it. Now you can go and you can go and argue. You can go and argue all, all the points you like. Order. The member for Mayo. You can go and argue all the points you like to on that, but that happens to be the fact of the matter. The for and uh, and there is and there is no getting away from it in this particular instance. Now the fact that a couple of you choose to rock on up to the speaker's chair and say that you're going to do something is neither here nor there, as you rightly pointed out, as you rightly pointed out in your own uh, in your own debating points in the course of your remarks. As you rightly pointed out, that sort of approach has absolutely no standing at all. You happen, you happen, to, think, you happen to think it makes you particularly courteous. Well, I'm very cheerful um, to hear that. The member for Curtin has a point of order. Look, I, in, in view of your remarks uh, before this motion was removed, where you, where you said uh, that you placed some reliance on being advised beforehand when someone gets up to make a point of order. And in having regard to what the Leader just said, he has made a gross reflection on you in the chair, and I'd ask that it be withdrawn. No, the Honourable the Leader of the House. The fact of the matter is, as, as every member of this House well understands, that proposition has absolutely no standing in this place at all. If the clerk is called and that brings on the business of the day, then that's it. There will be other opportunities in accordance with the standing orders, if it is possible for a member to get the recognition from the chair to get up and, uh, and make a presentation at, uh, at, uh, at, that, uh, at, at whatever, uh, whatever particular time those particular breaks in the program are, those particular breaks in the program are concerned. So there is, we, we have absolutely no problems dealing with the particular issue that the Leader of the Opposition happens to raise, but we do have a problem. We do have a problem with the persistent record that is being developed by this opposition in harassing speakers. Well, this opposition, you, you, you decided that you would draw attention. You decided in your remarks. Order. You decided in your remarks. 
in your remarks to draw attention. You decided in your remarks to draw. No, you didn't on that one. You went on at some considerable length, at some considerable length on that subject, and uh, in, in your criticism of the speaker and directing your abuse at this particular uh, at this particular acting speaker, and having introduced that record into debate and not being required to uh, close down your remarks on that, and given also that your successor in the debate also drew attention to that and was not called upon to, uh, to uh, uh, withdraw his remarks or cease his remarks in that regard, then I am responding to what was regarded as orderly remarks as far as you are concerned when you were participating in this debate. You sought to, uh, uh, to detail what you considered to be an unsatisfactory record of, uh, of speakers in this place. Well, the unsatisfactory record goes to your disruption as far as this place is concerned, which has been persistent. And, uh, and this simply is this particular dissent motion is of a piece with it. You say in this uh, chamber, the opposition has said in this chamber uh, that, uh, uh, that, as far as they're concerned, that they think it's a very unusual thing to move a motion of dissent from the chairman's ruling to move censures of, uh, uh, of, uh, of speakers and as of deputy speakers. I'm afraid it, it was once, but is no longer. Uh, this is our. This happens to be our daily fare as far as uh, the operations of this parliament is concerned, and this is of a piece with that type of contemptible behaviour. In order that we can get on with the other, uh, the other business before this House, the business that we must, uh, must deal with, I move the motion be put. The question is the uh, motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion, please say... Uh, oh, the question is the motion uh, be uh, agreed to. Those of that opinion, please say, I have the contrary, no. I think the ayes have... That's the closure motion. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is the question be now put. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Canning and Fowler tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is I 68, no 68. The, 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 result, the result is therefore equal. The chair would therefore rule that the debate may continue. The, the debate is not necessarily closed. I give my, therefore give my vote for the no's. Mr Speaker, 
Yes, the right honourable member for New England. Speaker, I want to add a few words to this debate because I think it needs to be understood that the proceedings and the uh, censure or the uh, dissent from your ruling revolves around a ruling made by one of your predecessors, Speaker Jenkins. Mr. Young should assist them. And I, I think that it's important the House understands that prior to Speaker Jenkins making that ruling, it was possible for a, a, a suspension of standing orders to be moved at any time. Speaker Jenkins, on the other hand, decided that it would not be practical or desirable for a suspension of standing orders to be made at any time. He determined that it was only in intervals between business other than on matters pertaining to the business before the House. And my concern, Mr Speaker, in your ruling is that what you have done is put at risk that determination made by Speaker Jenkins. Now, if it should be that you want to change that interpretation, and that, of course, is up to Mr Speaker's discretion, it might well be that the ruling you made was correct. But you have not indicated to this House that that is so. Now, let every member understand that the right to suspend standing orders is one that is only exercisable by a member rising in his place in an interval between business. Now, the Leader of the Opposition rose in his place. It was not necessary, but as a matter of courtesy, the Manager of Opposition Business had given you notice. But in this particular instance, the Leader of the Opposition, notice having been given, albeit briefly, the Leader of the Opposition rose and under Speaker Jenkins' ruling, it was imperative that the Leader of the Opposition be called or it was impossible for the proceedings of the House to proceed under the interpretation that Speaker Jenkins gave to our standing orders for the practices required to suspend standing orders to take place. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I put very strongly to you that it is obligatory for you to have called the Leader of the Opposition in a climate where the only procedure and practice available for a member of this House if he wishes to move suspension of standing orders, is for him to do so in an interval between business. That interval was there. You had not called the clerk. The Leader of the Opposition standing, being in his place, it was obligatory for you to call him. Now, if it should be as a result of this particular proceeding that the motion is lost, the result is going to be that you all, or your or Mr Speaker, will have to make another interpretation on Speaker Jenkins' ruling, because it's a sacred right of this place that there be an opportunity for members to suspend standing orders. Of course, it's an equal right for the members of this House to negate that suspension. But we're not talking about the negative of the motion. We're talking about the opportunity to speak. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, you are the temporary custodian of the rights and privileges of every member of this House. And as that custodian, it is you and you alone that has the obligation to call on any member when an, a ruling of your predecessor says it's the only opportunity that he can exercise that right. Now, if you don't pursue that ruling, what you're doing is you're letting down the rights of every member of this chamber. You are denying members the opportunity to exercise the privilege that your predecessor said was theirs. So you have a choice. You either accept that your ruling was wrong and you call the Leader of the Opposition, or, if the view that you have asserted is correct, you must then change the interpretation of the standing orders that your predecessor has imposed. Now, you can't have it both ways. There has to be an opportunity for suspension of standing orders. It's one of the sacred rights. It's written into Erskine and May. It's been adopted in Pettifer's parliamentary practice, upgraded in its various forms. And while it's up to the Speaker to interpret how it may be exercised, it's up to the House finally to determine whether or not way there might be an acceptance of that suspension of standing orders. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, I put to you that if you deny the Leader of the Opposition the call, then you are going against the text and the intent of Speaker Jenkins' ruling in this place. And that is not acceptable because no member in this place can accept 
that you can impose your will in such a way as to deny a member on his feet, particularly the Leader of the Opposition, the right and the opportunity to be called. And in that climate, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe it's an obligation on you to allow the Leader of the Opposition to speak and to permit him to move that suspension of standing orders. And if you don't do so, then I call on you to revise that interpretation of Speaker Jenkins and to allow the Leader of the Opposition to rise at any time, or any other member of this House, to rise at any time to suspend standing orders so they can intrude on whatever business that particular suspension of standing orders might entail. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I put to you quite seriously that it is an alternative which you now are called on to exercise. And I put to you the result of that last vote imposes a different obligation on you. And that different obligation is obviously that there is considerable concern in this House, reflected by an equality of voting, which ensures that you now have a greater obligation to give the Leader of the Opposition the call than would otherwise be the case. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are important issues. They are not matters that you can just defer or think that in some way some privilege or practice that you might like to impose can perhaps intrude. I mean, there is nothing more serious than the matter that the Leader of the Opposition wished to arise. That is the suspicion that a member has not complied with another standing order. That is the right of disclosing a personal as, a personal as distinct from a public interest. And if the Minister for Transport and Communications failed to make those disclosures, then he is transgressing Point of order, in a way that House. is quite this is clearly well away Le now from, um, the, uh, from the matters of the substance. Uh, the member for Bruce will remain well away from the, the House. substance of the, of the issues that we're debating here. They are, this is no longer a debate on the dissent. This has now become a, de a debate specifically on the substance of what it was that the Leader of the Opposition was attempting to move. The, uh, the right hon. Member for New England uh, has the call. He's straying a bit from the question. I took it he was summarising his position. Well, however, Mr. Speaker, the, Mr Deputy Speaker, the reason I raised it was that it goes back to the interpretation of the standing orders of this House. And it goes back to a matter of a suggested breach of the standing orders, which is an obligation enshrined in both Houses. And if a member has a personal obligation as distinct from any other member of the community, then he has an obligation to disclose. Now, we have several standing orders which are really written in to the Bible of this place. And it was that that I understand the Leader of the Opposition sought to address by suspending standing orders. Now, I put to you that the ruling you made in preventing him raising that matter is even more serious because of the nature of the character of that breach. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I seriously say to you, unless you accept the Leader of the Opposition's right to speak, then we are all in a very difficult position. And like the, the Leader of the National Party, I appeal to my two colleagues from, who are independents in this place to consider seriously the matters now before the Chamber. They are matters that pertain to the rights of them as much as anybody else. And should they wish to raise matters by way of motion, now that there are two of you, I suggest to you that the decision now being taken by the chair is one which affects your rights perhaps more than anybody other in this place. And I suggest to you it's very much in your interest. And presumably, if you meant those things that have been said, that they are also matters which you would want to support in any event. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important that you understand why this motion to send for me ruling has been made. It's because you are denying individuals a right which is theirs by our standing orders. And I would trust that you would recognise the consequence if that ruling is not changed. The question is the motion is moved by the Leader of the Opposition to be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Corio. The... Oh, then we'll go. Mr Speaker, I won't hold the House long. But, um, but I would suggest I would suggest that this motion arises out of a practice which has grown up in recent times in this House. The member for Bruce. Of denying the standing orders and manipulating them for the purposes of providing the media with its six o'clock news bulletins. The right to the call has never been an absolute right in this House. And it isn't an absolute right. It is certain that the Leader of the Opposition 
has privileges in the House which were largely developed during the time of Speaker Steddon, I might say. And I might also say to the House that it was not an unusual practice when the opposition was in government and the honourable member who has just spoken was the leader of the House for members to be denied the call on matters where they were seeking it for purposes of procedural or other motions. Mr Speaker, it is the choice of the chair to determine the business of the House, the manner in which it is conducted, and there is some res responsibility on the chair to ensure that the House's business is conducted. I don't think this is a serious motion. I believe that opportunities for the Leader of the Opposition to move such a motion do occur and, and are ample to provide him with the flexibility in his rights as a member. I doubt if there have ever been more suspension of standing orders in a short period of time than there have been during the period that the present Leader of the Opposition has been the Leader of the Opposition. It is part of his normal debating procedure. It is not a special occasion, as the member for New England would have us believe. It is part of the daily process of the opposition in this parliament planned and conducted that way. Mr Speaker, I believe you are entitled to the confidence of the House, and I am certain that you will obtain it. The question is the motion is moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Eyes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the Deputy Speaker's ruling be dissented from. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Wakefield and Riverina Darling Tellers for the eyes. The honourable members for Canning and uh, Fowler tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is ayes 65, noes 72. The division is therefore resolved in the negative. Honourable members quickly resume their seats. Honourable members quickly resume their seats. The member for MacArthur resume his seat. Order. The honourable member for MacArthur. The member for Boothby and the member for MacArthur might resume their seats or conduct their conversation outside. The Minister for Resources and the, Minister, the member for Riverina Darling might resume their seats. The Honourable the Minister for Small Business and Customs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know there's a big audience for a Public Works Committee referral. <laughs> you must have something interesting to say. Very much so. Me, the uh, Minister for Science will be pleased anyway. Now, on behalf of the Minister for Administrative Service, I move that in accordance with the